Okay. Okay. Man. All right. Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 20th of August, 2004, uh, approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Oh, my name is Manuel Perez, and I was born in Mexico, of all places. You know, it's quite a distance from here. But my parents moved to New Jersey back in 1927, I guess it was. My father came to New Jersey. He was a miner. He worked in, in the mines in New Jersey, in the zinc mines. And uh, shortly after he arrived in the States, why he sent for his wife, which was my mother, Carmen, and both she and I came to the United States. And uh, basically, I grew up in New Jersey. And I graduated from the Franklin High School in New Jersey in 1943, and it was the same year that I volunteered for the Army. Okay. I didn't wait to be drafted, I volunteered. All right. Um, do you remember, one of my questions would have been your educational background, but you told me that already. <laughs> um, do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes, sir. That was a Sunday, of course, as we all know, and uh, I was going to uh, a local football game. And uh, this was about noon that I got there, and lo and behold, during this football game in Ogdensburg, New Jersey, that was the day that we were notified that the Japanese had attacked us in Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. hmm. yes. You heard that during the football game? Yes. Do yeah. you remember your reaction to that? Well, I was astonished because I was surprised, of course. Because, as you well know, we were more or less uh, staying out of World War II at that point in time until we were attacked by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And, of course, after that, Roosevelt got the okay from the nation to go to war because we were more or less pacifists at that point in time, in my opinion. Okay. So you volunteered uh, shortly after... Graduating from high school, you said? Yes. Why did you pick the Army? Well, I wanted to get in the United States Air Force. I always loved to fly. I model airplanes, and I thought I'd get in the Air Force. And therefore, I joined the Army to be in the Air Force. But unfortunately, because I was born in Mexico, uh, they were only commissioning second lieutenants, citizens of the United States. I passed all my tests to become an aviation cadet, but unfortunately, I never got there simply because I wasn't an American citizen at that time. That's a kind of a unique thing because I was very disappointed because I ended up in the infantry, and um, after I volunteered, well, it was a big disappointment in my life anyhow because I volunteered basically to be in the Air Force, but I was in the infantry. And um, my infantry experience started in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where I joined the 106th Division. It was activated in February of 1943. And it was a brand new division that was put into that outfit. We went on maneuvers to in Tennessee shortly thereafter. And after the maneuvers in Tennessee, we ended up in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And while we were at Camp Atterbury, uh, the division, the 106, as I knew, it broke up a bit because they were having, they were anticipating the Normandy invasion, and of course they wanted more replacements. So they took me out of the 106th Division and sent me overseas as a replacement for the upcoming D-Day invasion. And uh, after that, of course, I've gotten into England. And this was in... Did you go in a convoy? Yes, convoy? yes. We sailed from Brooklyn out of uh, Camp Kilmer. We were stationed at Camp Kilmer and departed from Brooklyn Navy, Naval Yard. Mm -hmm. When did you arrive in England? I arrived in England in, in uh, your, the latter part of June. See, the... Of course, the invasion was in June, uh, June 6th, Normandy yes. the invasion. And uh, I didn't get into Normandy until uh, July 17th. 
at which time I joined the 30th Infantry Division. And the 30th Infantry Division is the division that I served primarily in Europe. And uh, we fought through Normandy. And then in July 25th, we broke out of Normandy after the breakthrough at St. Lo, at which time there were about 10,000 bombers that saturated the front lines. And then the 3rd Arm Armored Division, or Pan's Army, 3rd Army, they were able to break out of Normandy. Prior to that, we were more or less in a, a stalemate situation in Normandy fighting hedgerows. And we didn't really make very much progress because, as you all well know, D-Day was on July 6th and we were still confined to the Normandy beachhead area until July 25th when we broke out of Normandy after this bombing, at which time a lot of our troops were killed with our own bombers. But on July 25th we pushed out of Normandy and then we went down to the, the Mauritian area, which is near the Brittany Peninsula. And during that time in, in Mauritian, the Germans made a big push to drive us back into the ocean under Hitler's orders at all costs. And my outfit, the 30th Infantry Division, 2nd Battalion, 120th Regiment, was uh, they were surrounded. We were surrounded for seven days by the Germans at Mortain when they were trying to push to the sea at Avranche, I think was the name of the place. And fortunately we held, held them. And during that seven day period, we were cut off of course, and the only way they got supplies to us was by dropping artillery shells filled with medicines and batteries for our, our radios. But that was quite an experience because um, we had very limited medical supplies and uh, we suffered a great deal of casualties, but we held our positions. We never surrendered. The Germans offered us, you know, to surrender and they'd take care of us, but we didn't surrender. And uh, seven days after being encircled by the German forces, we were... Uh, they broke through our, 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 I think it was the 35th Division, finally broke, broke through and we were, uh, we were no longer encircled, but mm -hmm. we put up a quite a bit of resistance there. Um, what kind of food did you have during that time? We didn't have very much food. They parachuted food to us and of course uh, that all that food was most of it landed in German hands, but we appreciated what food that we did get. It was quite an experience. It's probably K rations, right? K, K rations, yes. Well, of course, that's that's, yeah. that's what we probably had. After the, that experience, and for, for that effort, we got our unit, the 120th Regiment, got the presidential citation, unit citation. And after the, that effort by the Germans to break through and throw us back into the sea was not successful, of course we pushed across France quite easily. The Germans, of course, were caught in a fillet's gap and they suffered a great deal of casualties there. And uh, Patton's Third Army broke across France into Paris on the 25th. August, 5th, August 25th was when Paris was liberated. And then it was pretty easy going from that point on until we hit the, the German, no, Belgium. We came to Belgium first, and this was in September. And uh, of course, that was near the Siegfried Line. This was in 40. 44, I believe it was. Now how long were you in the front lines? Well, uh, the ex life expectancy of an infantryman is not very long. I mean, we used to see replacements come up there one day, two days, 
and those poor folks were gone. I mean, the infantry turnover was quite drastic. You know, we suffered, suffered an awful lot of casualties being infantry folks. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I'm lucky. I very consider myself very lucky. But then, I'm probably not getting all this right, but about this December, we were outside of Ack, and our unit was outside of Ack, and, and on uh, December 15th, the Germans made one last ditch effort, which we all know as the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, so Germans, of course, pushed into the Battle of the Bulge and penetrated quite deeply into our lines. And ironically, the 106th Division, which I first served with in the United States, they had arrived in Europe and they were sent to a sector in the Ardennes, which was um, very quiet. So because the 106th Infantry Division was new, they put them in that area. But unfortunately, the Germans attacked during the Battle of the Bulge in the sector in which the 106th Division was in. And they took 6,000 American prisoners at that time and just punctured a big hole in the American lines. And I, of course, at that time was in the 30th Division up near Aachen in the 9th Army, but they sent us down south to uh, kind of push the Germans out of this battle of the bulge, the so-called bulge. So, uh, the 30th Infantry Division, which I belonged to at that time, was sent down to that sector, which was the 1st Army sector, and we fought there with the Germans beginning in, Ju in December and spent Christmas there during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, then in, Ju in January, we were attacking the Germans to try to push them back out of this bulge on the 15th, and that's when I was captured. The Germans threw a hand grenade into a building in which a lieutenant, myself, and several other soldiers were in, and the hand grenade exploded, of course, and killed the lieutenant next to me and wounded the other soldiers there and myself, I had shrap shrapnel on both legs at that time. And I was on my back and the Germans came in and asked us, handy hope, handy hope, that means surrender Germany. Of course, we had no choice but to surrender at that time. So th this was the 15th of January. Well, the German medics put me on a stretcher and took me behind their lines. And then at that point in time, they asked me if I had belonged to the Air Force. I don't know why they asked me that, because I was in the infantry. But anyhow, this German doctor says to me, well, you know what, you're very fortunate that you don't belong to the Air Force, because they had it in for the Air Force because they were bombing the living daylights out of those poor folks. And he says to me, if you were in the Air Force, I'd kill you right here on this table. But because you're in the infantry, I'll take care of your wounds. So he did remove some shrapnel out of my legs. And after that, they sent us back into the interior on a train. And I ended up in Stalag 11B, which is between Bremen, Hamburg, and that area in the northern part of Germany. So Can I, I go back for a second? Sure. Um, did you have any winter equipment when you were... Not per se. We, we didn't have good winter equipment. We had... Over shoes, over our combat shoes, mm -hmm. you see, that's about the best winter equipment we had. Whereas the Germans had camouflaged jackets, you know, mm -hmm. to blend into the snow and being white. Were you wearing an overcoat or uh, what kind of jacket were you wearing? Oh, just a, a, fatigue, a fatigue jacket. Mm -hmm. See, uh, in that respect, what they used to do is uh, whenever we were not pushing forward, we would be supplied with overcoats, woolen wool overcoats, mm -hmm. things of that nature. But normally, we left the, the overcoats behind. Okay. See. 
Okay, well, how was that? So you were you were placed in Stalag uh, 18B. You said. 11B. 11. I, I mean, I got 11. 11B. 11B. Yes, and this was in 1980. And I remained in Stalag 11B until April 5th, April 17th, 1980. While we were in Stalag uh, 11B, we got word that in the United States President Roosevelt had died in April. I think he died in, on the 13th of April. So we got word of that. Now, how did you hear that? On a radio. We have, we have radios. And I don't know where these. There was a lot, a lot of British prisoners in this Stalag 11B that I was in, and those folks had communications pretty good with the outside world. How they did it, I don't know. But we were notified that Roosevelt was killed. What was your, what were your feelings when you found that out? Well, we were kind of heartbroken because he was our leader at that time, Commander-in-Chief, as you all know. And uh, this was on the 15th of April. And on the 17th of April, the British 2nd Armored Division liberated our camp. And the Germans had left and let, left us there by ourselves. And but we were always grateful to the British Second Armored Division, who incidentally were known as the Desert Rats because they served in North Africa with General Montgomery going from the Suez to El Alamein or someplace. But I'll never forget that you know they were the British Desert Rats that liberated us. Now, did you ever have much medical treatment while you were in the camp, or was it just the initial treatment that you had? Basically, it was just the initial treatment mm -hmm. treatment that I had. You know, I'm very grateful to the Red Cross because during my stay, and I'm very fortunate that I was only a prisoner for three months, but if it had not been for the Red Cross parcels that the Red Cross sent over, a lot of us prisoners would have certainly died because in this same prison camp there was a, a Russian contingent there and every day we could see cartloads of German cor uh, Ger Russian corpse being just wheeled away in these uh, carts you know they, they were dying from malnutrition so we were very grateful for the fact that the Red Cross provided the Red Cross parcels what kind of food did the Germans feed you oh the Germans uh, had us on very meager rations. It probably was uh, one serving of uh, potato soup per day. So uh, what we used to do in the spring, you know, being that time of year, we used to go out and gather dandelions and kind of put them in with the, the German soup, potato soup that the Germans had prepared for us. That supplemented a little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Wow. I guess that's that's about all. I'm, I'm liberated now by the British, you see. Mm -hmm. And shortly after liberation, why uh, they put us on C C's 47s and flew us to Brussels, and from Brussels they flew us to uh, La Havre, and from La Havre they put us on a troop sh ship and sent us back to the United States. And uh, I remember very distinctly that we were on the high seas in May, about the 8th of May, when the Germans surrendered in in Germany. Of course, being one of the first GIs to get back to the States, we were all treated like heroes, you know, when we arrived in the country. I mean, the war was just over and those poor guys in Japan were still fighting the Japanese, but I was lucky that, you know, I came to the United States early on and I was treated like a prince. Mm -hmm. Did you have to be hospitalized at all? Uh, yes, very sh shortly for some of the shrapnel that I had in my both legs. You know. Basically, that's a brief synopsis of my experiences. I, I hope I didn't talk too no, long. No, 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 not at all. Um, now, you stayed in the service until November. Were you hospitalized until then? I think that's when you said you were discharged. Well, uh, I was hospitalized just for about two weeks in Fort oh, okay. Dix, at which time they removed some more shrapnel mm -hmm. from my leg. Mm -hmm. 
And when I was discharged from the Army, I was granted a 30% disability. But unfortunately, uh, during Eisenhower's administration, which surprised me because he made drastic cuts on the VA at that time, and it took my disability away from me from 30% down to 10%. This happened in 1959. And I guess I was quite bitter about the whole thing. I appealed it, but it didn't do me any good. You want me to carry on like no, this? No, that's or? fine. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I mean, it, it makes, uh, I don't know what it makes, but this is the truth. This is what happened. In 59, I was cut down to 10% disability. But, you know, all things turn out for the best because recently I've been reevaluated and I am very grateful that the, under Bush's administration at any rate, the POWs have been treated been treated very well. They have reevaluated most of the POWs. And as a matter of fact, there are 11,000 POWs that are, we're still looking for. The VA would like those POWs to come forth and claim some of the benefits that are truly theirs for the asking. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a statement that I would strongly like to make to all former POWs. Okay, after you were discharged, did you uh, make any use of the GI Bill? Oh yes, after I was discharged, I did make use of the GI Bill. I went to Paul Smith's College in uh, upstate New York, and uh, unfortunately I dropped out after the first year, and then I got a, an opportunity to, to uh, under the GI Bill still, to uh, take an apprenticeship as a printer, and I became a journeyman printer through, by, through the GI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. you know. Did you ever use the 5220 Club? Oh yes, shortly after discharge, everybody that had a ruptured duck, of course, was uh, eligible to receive uh, the 5220 club. Mm -hmm. I didn't take the full amount because I went to college up to Paul Smith's, but I did participate in that. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, of course, I was pretty bitter after what happened to me in 59 when my disability was reduced, such as it was. and. Uh, I uh, stayed away from them until just recently I became a member of the um, American Sable Veterans and uh, former POWs. I belong to both those organizations at the present time. You never joined the VFW? or American I joined the VFW or? back um, in the 50s, but they were my advocates for my claim mm -hmm. that I uh, well, I would just deny it, you see, mm -hmm. but they did try to help me, but they were not able to mm -hmm. at that time. Did you ever stay in uh, contact with anyone that served with you? No, I did not, because uh, the 30th Infantry Division was deactivated shortly after I got back to the States, and um, they, I, apparently they never had very many reunions, because I've looked in a lot of publications and never found any of their reunions, whereas the 106th Infantry Divisions is famous at this point in time because they, those guys are always meeting. You know, they have mm -hmm. regular reunions frequently. Mm -hmm. And the reason I keep track of, of those fellows is because I originally was a member of the 106th also. Mm -hmm. How do you think um, your time in the service had an effect on your life? Well, I had a a great effect in my life. It, it taught me a lot of things. It told me, taught me to be responsible, to be considerate of other people, and things of that nature. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Oh, I hope, I, hope I didn't talk too did much. You want, did well, you want to hold that photograph. picture up? Oh. <clears throat> Can I have this back? Oh, well, no. You just hold it up in front of you. Oh. Oh, God. So, so small. <laughs> yeah. He'll focus oh, yeah. in. Yeah. Now, where and when was that taken? Oh, this was taken on maneuvers in Tennessee in 1944. Okay, can you just tilt it towards me a little bit because you got some glare there? That's perfect. 
right there is good. Just hold it there. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember all this stuff. But I, I, the short synapses. <laughs>